American children in over 140 K-12 schools indoctrinated with Chinese Communist Party's education. Angry protests break out in northern China. But what has concerned parents taking to the streets there? Two banned ballistic missiles shown off by North Korea's leader to impress a Russian minister at a weapons exhibition. And the CCP will use this technology for evil. That's the former U.S. counterintelligence chief's warning to Washington. Is Beijing capable of handling critical 21st century technology? What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Are American kids getting educated by communist China? That's the warning from an anti-indoctrination group, saying they've uncovered evidence showing the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, poured millions into America's K-12 schools. The group Parents Defending Education issuing their latest report to 34 governors, key lawmakers and committee chairs on Wednesday. Their report, Little Red Classrooms, warns American children could be subject to Chinese propaganda in their own schools. That's under the pretense of cultural exchange. The report notes 143 school districts across the United States have engaged in contracts to establish Confucius Institutes in classrooms, including in three of the nation's top science and technology high schools, adding that several of them are located nearby 20 U.S. military bases. That's all to the tune of nearly $18 million of funding from 2009 through 2023. The group noted a pair of Chinese nationals who taught Mandarin in a Delaware school district during the 2012 to 2013 school year. They cited the district's webpage, which stated these teachers underwent a rigorous selection process in China, including interviews with Chinese state officials at the national level. The group warns this is part of the Chinese Communist Party's broader soft power strategy, aiming to influence policy in nations throughout the world. The group requests state and federal officials immediately investigate the scope of China's involvement, influence and access to our K-12 student information and curriculum, adding families should also have full access to view how these cultural and language immersion programs are financed. A terrorism event. That's what the former U.S. counterintelligence chief says the U.S. is facing as it navigates ties with the Chinese Communist Party. In a congressional hearing Wednesday, he said it's naive to think the U.S. would be able to come to any kind of agreement with the Chinese regime on issues around critical and emerging technologies. Entities Jeremy Sandberg has more on his testimony. The hearing before the House Select Committee on the CCP was called Commanding Heights, ensuring U.S. leadership in the critical and emerging technologies of the 21st century. William Evanina, former director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, was one of three witnesses who testified. I would offer to this committee that we are in a terrorism event. He says the CCP is an existential and unparalleled threat to the U.S. The former counterintelligence chief says the CCP's economic war with the U.S. has manifested itself into a terrorism framework. A slow, methodical, strategic, persistent and enduring event which requires a degree of urgency of government and corporate action. Evanina says the U.S. private sector has become the geopolitical battle space for China, as a lot of the CCP's non-conventional intel collection is performed amid business transactions and research activities. He was asked if it's fair to say there's no such thing as a truly private company in China. And uh, in my experience uh, in the intelligence community the last decade, I have not seen an example of a private company that is either not owned, operated, or influenced by the Communist Party of China. Evanina recommended a new economic threat intelligence entity that would share real-time threat information with U.S. private companies to mitigate risks in doing business with China. And it has to be direct conversation with the CEOs and the boards of directors of those companies. So they're aware that China's coming for their technology. And then we should hold them accountable to protect those technologies. According to the FBI, the annual cost of the CCP's intellectual property and trade secrets thefts amounts to $225 billion to $600 billion. That's equivalent to a lost wealth of about $4,000 to $6,000 after tax value per American family of four. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News.
As Russian and Chinese envoys set foot in North Korea for a rare visit, leader Kim Jong-un welcomed Russia's defense minister with an arms exhibition like no other. Photos shared by North Korean media Thursday showcase some highlights, including new drones and two banned ballistic missiles. Both warheads were test-launched by North Korea this year. Let's take a closer look. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un showed Russia's defense minister the country's banned ballistic missiles at a defense exhibition as the neighbors pledged to boost ties. That's according to North Korean state media on Thursday. The Russian minister Sergei Shoigu and a Chinese delegation led by a Communist Party Politburo member arrived in North Korea this week. They're visiting for the 70th anniversary of the end of the Korean War, celebrated in North Korea as Victory Day. The nuclear-capable missiles were banned under UN Security Council resolutions adopted with Russian and Chinese support. But they provided a striking backdrop for a show of solidarity by three countries united by their rivalry with the US. Shoigu is making the first visit by a Russian defense minister to North Korea since the fall of the Soviet Union. For North Korea, the arrival of the delegations marks its first major opening up to the world since the COVID-19 pandemic. North Korean media reported that Shoigu gave Kim a letter from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Kim said the visit had deepened what he called the strategic and traditional relations between North Korea and Russia. North Korean media said Kim expressed the belief that, quote, the Russian army and people would achieve big successes in the struggle for building a powerful country. Local media reports on KCNA did not refer to the war in Ukraine. But North Korea's defense minister, Kang Sun Nam, was reported as saying North Korea fully supported what he called Russia's battle for justice and to protect its sovereignty. North Korean media said Kim also met Chinese Communist Party Politburo member Li Hongzhong for talks. Protests sparking in northern China starting last week. <laughs> Angry parents demanded authorities give their children a fair chance at an education. NTD spoke to one of them on the scene. To protect his identity, we've distorted his voice. I think there were about 400 people or even more. I saw police officers in front of the state agency receiving protesters. There were about 100 of them. These parents said they're angry about the unfair distribution of educational resources. According to them, over 40,000 students from nearby Henan province came to the area to take their high school exams. And because of it, these students pushed up the cutoff score for local high schools, making it harder for local kids to get accepted. Authorities arrested at least 10 people for alleged fraud and said they are investigating the education companies involved. After dedicating years to get a college diploma, a growing number of young adults in China are taking on the role of caregiver for their parents and diverting from their intended career paths to do it. Let's zoom in. Full-time children. The phrase describes a so-called job that pays kids for taking care of their parents, where grown-up children stay at home. An expert gives his take on the situation. The invention of the term full-time children is just another way of saying large numbers of young people are unemployed. According to official data released this year, China's unemployment rate exceeds 21 percent. That means almost 2.5 million college students can't find a job in China. Though a professor at one of China's top institutes, Peking University, anticipates that the true figure is pushing 50 percent, double the number released by Beijing. According to a Chinese job hunting agency, 13.3 percent of recent graduates are now classified by the term. On a Chinese social media platform, over 4,000 users shared posts or comments discussing their experiences as full-time kids. Some claimed it to be a short-term phrase, while others suggest it could be a lifestyle choice. Chinese society is undergoing distortion, and this includes the distortion of values. Under Beijing's three-year zero-COVID-19 policy, strict lockdown measures interrupted economic activities on a mass scale. Many small to medium-sized businesses shut down. And with supply chains paused, many foreign companies operating in China started seeking greener pastures, shifting production to other nations. Now China's job market is wounded more severely than ever. 
and the country's youth are feeling the impacts. A leading China critic is calling for a values-based economic alliance. That's to defend against Chinese aggression. It comes after a recent report highlighted how China is looking for an advantage in a global values struggle. NTD's Malcolm Hudson has the report. Democracies have failed to stand up to China and have instead let go of their principles. That's according to Jian Li Yang, founder and president of Citizen Power Initiatives for China. He says it's difficult to confront China on human rights issues and that democracies have been dropping their values for one main reason. China has no moral authority. The only power it has is money. And uh, its model, you know, its money power actually is appealing everywhere in the world. Yang is calling for the formation of a so-called values-based economic NATO to guard against China. Nations in this alliance would support each other economically if China tries to punish them for standing up for their values. When one of the countries was attacked economically by China because of value-related conflict, other countries come to help. For example, in 2020, Australia called for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19. China responded to this by punishing Australia with steep trade tariffs such as on wine. Coming to Australia's defence, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China launched a campaign urging people to buy Australian wine. Similar campaigns have emerged when China attempted to punish other nations like Lithuania. But these campaigns are isolated. Yang says they should be a broad and united initiative. So I think these models deserve to be institutionalized. That, that is why I advocate for a value-based economy NATO. Yang says nations will find that economic relations with China will affect their national security. And he adds that with the possibility of China invading Taiwan, it's vitally important to have a values-based economic NATO already prepared and set up. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. Another big story to look out for, a controversial Chinese naval base reportedly near completion in the Indo-Pacific. Satellite images show the pier wide enough to host aircraft carriers. What's even more surprising, it's striking resemblance in design and size to China's overseas base in Djibouti, East Africa. Could the new base give China an upper hand in a potential conflict with Washington? That report and more coming up tomorrow on China in Focus. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Competitors, adversaries, or enemies. The strategic competition between the U.S. and China is becoming increasingly risky as both sides begin framing their relationship as a rivalry. How should the U.S. navigate a changing world order with Beijing's rising aggressions? And what effect do the colliding powers have on people's daily lives? We sat down with Doug Bandao, senior fellow at the Cato Institute, for details. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.